Okay, so we're going to invite um, all of our speakers back up here for um, panel, and so invite any questions that any of you might have. Please go ahead and introduce yourself first prior to the question. Can we dim the lights? <laughs> Mine will make a sunglasses. Hopefully my sunglasses are coming out. Good. Excellent set of presentations. So I'm going to jump in since nobody else is lining up right now. It's <laughs> good. Uh, and it's interesting, uh, Donna closed on the, ta on the ontologies, taxonomies issue. That was one of the notes that I put under Carol's thing. When you said multiple methods of measurement are going to be used depending upon the situation, well, what's going to undergird that are the appropriate uh, ontologies to help us bond, bind these, these uh, the knowledge together that these different tools uh, help us collect. Um, I have lots of interesting notes, but one of the things that I think is mis most instructive here, I'm not sure that everybody in this group knows what the Cyber Physical Systems Initiative is, is or the Smart and Connected Health or whatnot. So I would encourage the groups, when the groups are looking at barriers, opportunities or whatnot, to maybe potentially take a little bit of time and share amongst the group so that the report that reporting actually collects this, the mechanisms that you have used. Uh, because there should almost be a box with an example or two of this from NSF, from uh, NIH, potentially other sources, pri private sector sources, that, that, that are really key because there have been a number of things that have been talked about here that are enormously important in this, in this multidisciplinary research. But again, if, if we can leave with a, com a greater common understanding of that, that's great. I just, I love this notion of the application of the cyber physical systems, but my guess is not many in this room, you know, know what that is. So, uh -huh. really important. Great job. Those remarks. You had a question? We need well, questions. Come no. on, you guys. <laughs> well, first, thanks to all of you. These really wonderful talks. I didn't fall asleep at all. <laughs> um, David Clerkfeld, USDA. I'd like to talk, uh, ask Carol a question. Um, in all of the flow charts you showed for analysis of the both passive and active systems for recording food intake, you had to come back to the participant for <laughs> clarifications, definitions, whatever. And then you s also showed us that with at least one of the systems, it took nine hours of expert um, evaluation of the images. And so my question is, when do you come back to the participant? The next day or three months later? Um, w actually, that nine hours includes the, includes the analysis because that's coming off of the big data. I mean, there have been tons of images and they have to be filtered through to find the food. And that's where the nine, some of it is um, people, but a lot of it is crunching too. It just puts into perspective the amount of time that this takes and eventually hopefully it will be less time. And you know, the, the person who wrote that sentence is sitting right behind you there. So you can also, you know, pipe up Tom, if you want to add anything to that. <laughs> and then um, that's, some of this can be turned around fairly quickly. Um, but it really depends on the system and how you set it up. And, and so it, I guess there isn't a, a way to exactly answer that in a way that I can say, do this, check this off. When you have this situation, check this off. But I think we have enough, um, enough opportunities now with regard to the way that we've been broadening out and we can still do more that we don't have to sometimes do what we've done before. We can go ahead and try something new. And then it, it may take some, depending on what you're collecting for. You know, for example, if you're collecting, this isn't, I mean, and Haynes, I don't know if they give feedback to the people. So if you're doing a study that you'll never give feedback, it's purely for collection, it's not as big of an issue. But if you're getting feedback, you better pick a method that you're gonna get feedback back quickly. And no question about it. Or even if you are planning on giving them feedback six months later, with some of these methods, that actually might be challenging. But I mean, it's a, it was a point that I probably should have put in a little bit more. Here's that tail. <laughs> yeah. So um, actually, Carol knows this very well, but for those folks who are sensor people in the room, um, showing that, that uh, tray of food with the, the apple, the soup, and the glass of milk, you know, glass of milk, if it's fat-free or full-fat milk, it's two-fold difference in calories. 
and you can have a fourfold difference in the salt content of noodle soup. And you can't ask a three-year-old those kinds of questions. That's that, that well. That's right. Some of them. It's amazing how much some of these three-year-olds know now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, you're seeing these kids, but you saw that little boy. He was ready to come out. Mm -hmm. Can you go ahead on the left? Uh, great presentations. Thanks, uh, Robin Shook, Children's Mercy, Kansas City. Uh, this is for Jacqueline, I guess. Uh, are we? Uh, do you know if there's any activity monitors, physical activity monitors? either on the market or in development that are designed specifically for children, or are we just using uh, activity monitors designed for adults to assess physical activity in children? I know, for example, like the Vivo Fit Junior is a, is a, a, a version of the Vivo Fit designed for adults, but created for children. No idea. Anybody else answer that I question? I'm I not, I, as I say, I'm not the youth person <laughs> tracking this. I can, I can answer that. There are several made specifically for children but they are not, their innards aren't made specifically for children. They are, their outers right. are made specifically, so they're cute and they might have a nice interface like um, mm -hmm. oh, Zamzi that now is currently, at least for a while, defunct, but um, but they're not developed different, they're, it's the same darn accelerometer. Right. Gotcha question. Yes, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. So what, what are some of those? <laughs> um, I have a whole list of them. Don't okay. make me do that right now here. I just gave a talk, no brain. Okay, <laughs> but I can I can get that. Sounds to you. good. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you guys for a great talk. Um, <clears throat> this is a question for all three of you because I know you can each have probably have an interesting insight here. Just uh, building on uh, Donna's point about you know finding signal and noise. Each of you have had experience exploring and finding new signals in what might otherwise be perceived as noisy data, whether that be images with you on either side and everything you're digging into in the home, right? So can you guys, do you have any examples of ones that you think were maybe signals that you didn't realize that you were looking for, that you, but you did find, or something that we could think uh, that, like for example, maybe, uh, I know like Jack, like with uh, Matt, we've been looking at a lot about the cyclicality within accelerometry data and how that seems to be a really interesting pattern in and of itself. But I wanted to, I, I asked this question more as kind of a, a thought experiment into the next phase where what are those interesting, surprising ones that might be able to spur us to think more about these hidden signals and the noise of the data you guys have all played around with? Uh, well, time is fabulous. It's, it's amazing. And then uh, the other is food co-occurrence patterns. It ends up that you, you it's amazing. People really don't eat that many foods in the day. And then if you see one food, you'll be able to guess the other three around it. You know, it's it's you know it's you know it's so we, and it, it's really improved. So we had identification, and then when we put in all these other concepts, it, that really has helped with the identification. And there there are more. I mean, it's but those are the ones that come out. Does that make sense? So my favorite one is not my own, but it's, it's such a good illustration, and that is that. Um, in, um, I th it's actually came partially out of USC, but kids are playing games and we're giving them questionnaires afterwards. You know, how engaging was that? You know, were you d did you like X, Y, and Z? Until s some engineer woke up in the middle of the night and said, Eureka, I can know that. It's all this junk data on the back end that I've been throwing away. It's like, how many times did they open the app? How long did they stay on the page? How many days did they use it? So that's, it was data that people were throwing away. In, 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 for instance, in the, in the um, game that we made for uh, vir virtual sprouts for teaching gardening, you know, the way that the kids travel through the game, just the usage on the back end that people th throw away half the time, is you, if, you're really a, if you really want to dig into that as an educator, you could spit out progress reports without ever testing your kids again. So it's and it's been considered junk data for so long that people aren't using it. And it's it's just gold mine. So I think that's my best example. And and I don't have an example. I think I'm the poopy pants here because it's the opposite in what I'm finding. So when I'm trying to match GPS poopy data pants. with um, a food environment, and I have an image that tells me that the person was eating, I can see a McDonald's in the picture. I know they're in McDonald's, 
can I actually match the GPS and the GIS data so that I don't have to have the camera? No, I can't. So when you're asking me for like the mobile data to knowledge to predict when to intervene when somebody's going to go into a fast food restaurant, I can't even give you the truth to develop a prediction model. There's so much error between the, the GPS, the, the, the GIS, um, and you know we have all these situations where somebody's on the fifth floor of an office building, the, the bagel shop's underneath, so are they in the bagel shop all day? And, uh, and the way you know the computer <laughs> scientists kind of say to me, well, can't you just take out some of those people so that your predictions work better? I'm like, no, this is what I'm trying to predict is real life. So, you know, uh, I, I think that's where I come from is, so I'd really try to step back on this because again, with the, the mobile data to knowledge, you know, Kevin always says, can do attitude on this. I'm like, okay, I cannot <laughs> give you a prediction. Okay, that's accurate. But what probability can I say, well, when all these things are probably together, <coughs> and then what's the tipping point that it would be worth you actually sending a message to say, um, you know, this place is here instead? Um, we, we've got to get there. So that's why, in some ways, I, I, you know, I feel like we've been lost in many ways in the in the measurement um, and trying to get that precision. And if we could step back and say, well, to actually intervene. I'm never going to get that one-to-one -one so, here. So what could you so, get? So what can I get yeah. and what is enough for me to get so that it's worth me saying the chances of me giving you a message now that's going to work, testing with my micro-randomization designs, I, I'll do it. So I, I think that's also where, where we have to, to get to. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I definitely go back and forth on this. <laughs> Ramesh. Easy, thanks. Uh, perfect segue. My question is about micronutrients and the importance of tracking micronutrients. And I think it's going to be difficult to do that, uh, like we heard with salt and potassium. I read that only 2% of the American population gets 4,700 milligrams of potassium a day. Uh, so is there a way, I is it important first, and is there a way to use cravings to figure out if there is a deficiency or if there is abuse? Uh, so if you want to really do behavior intervention, instead of telling them to count things which are erratically reported and difficult to track, are there signals like food cravings that actually tell you what you should be doing or not doing? I don't know. I don't, I don't know if we can, I mean, there are, there, there is some, something on that. You, you might even know that. Do you know that, that there, are there any food cravings that can be diagnostic? Um, there definitely are some electrolyte imbalances, and then definitely um, people try to self-correct, you know, um, particularly right with salt and water, those particular things, either by drinking more liquids or eating more salty foods. Um, but having said that, it's also been shown that for many people, like for cardiac patients who have to accept a lower sodium diet, can often reset what their expectations and their desires are. So. It is modifiable, but there is there is a an, I think a point at which you tip so far that the body will try to self correct, and then there's a um, there's also some modifiable component that's kind of within the normal range. But also in answer to one of your I thoughts of you know how are we going to find out about the you know really zero in on the food composition, and David who was just up here knows more about you know that one of the where yeah where is he <laughs> over there. I'm not uh, pointing. Knows more about this, but there is a real push to try to improve our food composition tables that we can do better matching up with the foods to be able to zero down into our, you know, m micronutrients, and it and industry is involved in this. It's it's quite exciting, and the first release is out right now at the USDA at the um, the National Data Laboratory. And so, so part of the big barrier with that really is having the food composition tables at an adequate level to be able to do that without ourselves doing the proximate analysis on the sample of food. But can I reframe the question? I mean, I think it, it really depends on what you're trying to do. So if you're trying to intervene in a home, for instance, and you want somebody to eat less salt, you know, I can imagine using tags in the home to you know, to get the real, the real offenders tagged up, so that you could know, might even you know, put a buzzer on them. You know, don't touch that salt shaker. <laughs> 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 there, there, 
So it really depends. So salt is how the you easy want. one, but if it was iron, if it was magnesium, if it was potassium, yeah. which you don't actually taste easily. Mm -hmm. But then, y if you let's say that you do an expensive and infrequent measure of, you know, you go to the doctor and your doctor says you need more potassium, and then you know these are the three best foods. I mean, there's, I, y it, yes, sometimes you really need to know exactly, but I also think depending on the question, there's, you know. I'm, I'm sure my doctor wishes that my vitamin D pill box was tagged because she keeps saying, how can you be vitamin D in, in, in inefficient, insufficient? I d you're supposed to be taking a million a day. And I just like, I forget. So it depends on what you want to do. Do you need it? When it's, what's the question? How accurate does it need to be? That's what I think. Yeah, that was actually the question. Do you think micronutrients are important? That was the first question. Sometimes, yeah. Just so maybe one last question, Camille. Oh, thank you. That was a great presentation, all of you. Um, Donna, you brought up the um, audio recording. And I think in the last two to three weeks, I've been connected with four different people who want to use audio recording. And some only want the signal. They only want it, the duration, the frequency. Others want words. And they want words in conversation. Mm -hmm. um, there's a tool called iEar. Yeah. that was designed by a guy at University of Arizona. Yeah, People want to use it. The IRBs are now saying, no, you can't. Yeah. Some of it's legal because the law says if there's an expectation that your conversation is being recorded, or I think it might be your communication, mm -hmm. you have to put signage up or mm -hmm. say something. Mm -hmm. But I think when that law was written, the communication was probably that phone call or the wireless mm -hmm. tapping. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of different communication or conversation than we have now. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that we come up with a solution for audio recording because people can learn a lot about health from that. But what are the steps to get there? So I think we, I have no idea, but I can guess. Okay. I think we live in a, you know, the environment is changing all the time. And there is, I think, simultaneously an, a, a a group of people that are getting more and more uptight about this and a group of people that are getting more and more relaxed about it. And the people that are getting more and more relaxed about it are often the people that we work with. You know, it's good for services. If you can explain to me why you need this and, and why it might help the health of the nation, sure. And so I think, I think that we need data to show our institutional review boards that yeah. participants are, are down with it. And yeah. Could I add to this? Because I actually think this is an engineering challenge. I think this is something that should potentially be added to the list of things that we need. If this is a requirement, if you're finding researchers mm -hmm. having a need for something like this, mm -hmm. then then there needs to be a way to potentially solve this. And I'm thinking of the work Tansy and Chowdhury has done, for example, on voice, but stripping away any of the ID. ID and yep. and yeah, but she wasn't. She was using not words. I don't think she was using she sound. She was traces. capturing words, but but the words were then denatured essentially, so that they weren't. I mean, she was obviously obviously ca capturing the sound. But it, what I'm getting at is this notion that if this is a requirement that is brought out in your discussion, mm -hmm. that this need is there, then this needs to be put on the table as part of the future research agenda. Mm -hmm. And either someone has solved this or it is a problem yet to be solved. I'm going to put the question up on the core forum so we all can have a conversation yeah, about it. That sounds Come good. up with a solution. Because yeah. it's, it's an important question and nobody knows how to answer it yet. And IRBs are certainly not the place to go because they don't have the answer. No. So, Kevin, my question to you then is if we're using, I mean, the run one reason to want all the words is, is to use natural language processing on it. So to what extent can you scramble? And still That's a good question. But, again, I, I think I would put that to some really smart yeah. engineers in NLP and, yeah. and other areas because yeah. it's, um, you know, to me, I won't take no for an answer on whether there's a solution to this until they say, gosh, there's just no way to do there's this. There's a solution. Oh, I alluded to sure. that this morning. Yeah. Okay. So, it's, so it's, it's, again, this conference is about really sort of defining some of the challenges, okay. some of the needs that we have. Mm -hmm. And if, in fact, people are asking for this for a variety of mm -hmm. reasons, mm -hmm. then let's try and see whether we can't bridge this gap. Mm -hmm. And I think all three of you really touched on the notion of, of the fact that you're, you come from groups that are remarkably interdisciplinary. So mm -hmm. you're bringing the health side of this, the machine learning, the other stuff. Mm -hmm. So I... I'd, I think these are questions, and it's, it's just as important mm -hmm. to leave this meeting with lots of good questions mm -hmm. as anything else, mm -hmm. because this will feed into the, into the documents mm -hmm. we hope mm -hmm. to create. Mm -hmm.
Um, so we are running out of time. Yeah, so I, so I just had one quick question that I'd kind of throw at you um, just before we go. So I'm a practicing uh, health professional, um, and um, it is becoming more frequent that families are bringing in data from their sensors. Um, and I think it's a frustration for us as health professionals because we actually don't know what to do with this data, nor how to analyze it, nor what variables to take out of it to apply to a personal relationship with our patient. Because we, although we often you know, apply concepts that we learn from randomized controlled trials and cause relationships from research, in the end we do practice personalized medicine as we have a personal relationship with our patients. And um, yeah, I guess my question is just also an urgency to say that it would be it would be wonderful for us for you all to come up with common measures that could be have meaning for us in the end because you know as people start to bring in this data and as they go through some you know pro algorithm that you've all developed to develop an outcome that's what we're ultimately going to use but if we can't have a common way to kind of look at that across studies and understand you know you talk about thresholds well what thresholds are those because we have very different types of thresholds in medicine as to what is sensitivity and specificity and how we want to use one test versus another in terms of diagnostic criteria because those often then mandate various treatments and um, you know, I, I just encourage you to kind of think about that as you're moving forward and to have those open conversations and sharing of data that are, in the end, going to be so important for us as health practitioners. This is, this is one for your board, Eric, um, um, Kevin. And I, the thing that comes to mind is something that we were working on, but then we got the MT Fed grant and we sort of dropped everything. And that is there's a, a woman who, who's been here before for the quantified self. I'm not going to remember her name right away, but she did Fluxstream. Which is a BY, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Carnegie. She's from Carnegie Mellon. And what uh, what Fluxstream was for quantified selfers who wanted to bring BYOD because that's what you're talking about, bring your own device, and be able to get all of that data up in some meaningful way visualized that had meaning. And and it's it's hard because uh, there's so many devices, but I think I think it's such an important ask that you're making here. Yeah. Yeah. So it all yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to invite Heather who's going to um, come and speak to you about how to go to your breakout groups. So I want to first start by thanking all of the speakers um, today. It's been a really terrific start to the summit. Um, so as you know from the program, um, the breakout group discussions are a really big part of the summit. And um, we are going to have our first breakout group to now. Um, I think we have about five or ten minutes for a quick break, and then I'm going to ask you all to divide into your various groups. Everyone should have a colored dot on their name tag. Um, if you're in the red group, you're actually going to come back here into the auditorium. Um, Donna uh, Sprout Metz is going to be the discussion leader, um, and you're going to be uh, everybody's going to be uh, discussing all three of the questions. We have questions A, B, and C, but we want the red group to focus primarily on the A question. Um, and Donna will have all of this information, so she'll be leading you through this. If you're in the blue group, Carol Boucher is your discussion leader. You're going to be in room 5302. If you take the elevator or the steps to the fifth floor, you want to <laughs> go off to the right, and it's a beautiful room with a great view. Um, the green group is going to be in room 4004, and that's literally straight ahead from the elevator on the fourth floor and we will be around to help guide you. So take a quick break, but at 3.15, if we could all meet back in our rooms, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna be in the breakouts till about 4.30, then we're all gonna come back in here for um, reporting out and discussion, and then following that, we're gonna have our poster reception. So thank you, and let me know if you have any questions.